Dunedin's development took a turn for the better with the establishment of a provincial government in 1853. Captain Cargill was elected unopposed to be its first leader or superintendent, supported by an elected council that would be responsible for things like land sales, public works, law and order, and most importantly for our story, immigration. It met for the first time in January 1854, and for the first time since the demise of the New Zealand Company, there was funding and authority for public works programs in Dunedin. This was great news because Dunedin's roads had deteriorated badly with the traffic of the previous seven years and were in a dire state. The muddy little village well meriting the nickname Mud Eden. One historian described the town at this point as a depressing little huddle of primitive buildings in a muddy hollow. There was progress nonetheless. Parts of this house date from the early 1850s and its original wing is perhaps the second oldest house in Dunedin. It was built for a passenger on the Philip Lang, John Boyle Todd, a Glaswegian from the Gorbils. And it's a sign of Dunedin's continually improving housing stock as wooden cottages like this gradually replaced the original clay houses. But Todd's story also raises some questions. Todd was just 16 when he emigrated having been an apprentice printer in Glasgow. You'd have to wonder why. He was not an ardent Free Church member, and like many of the very first settlers, he seemed ill-suited by trade and background to the work of pioneering. What did he think he would do in a brand new colony? Did he foresee the need for his printing skills? If so, he proved rather prescient, as within a year he was in fact taken on by Henry Graham to print the Otago News. When it collapsed, he transferred to its replacement, the Otago Witness, and was the sole staff member other than the editor. Young Todd actually prospered through Dunedin's years of stagnation in the early 1850s. He was secretary, for instance, of an Otago property investment company, established by some of the settlement's working men in 1853 as a kind of mutual saving scheme to invest in land. It's thought he built this wooden cottage in that year, and the following year, he married Isabella Calder, a passenger off the mariner who came from Caithness. Now, unfortunately, he caught a chill and died within days of the wedding, so he never got to enjoy the long life of so many of his fellow early settlers, and he has no descendants, there are no portraits of him, we have no idea of what he looked like. His house, though, does survive, and in a way, it offers a telling visual metaphor for Dunedin's growth and development. Todd's widow Isabella remarried five months after his death to an aspiring though unqualified builder, Henry Frederick Hardy, who added a second wing to the house. They had eight children together. Hardy would go on to develop into one of Dunedin's most important architects, also building this house below and this one above the Todd Cottage. You can see the increasing scale and elaboration of the three. Markers of Dunedin's rise from a muddy little village to New Zealand's finest Victorian city. In 1855, the Edinburgh law firm of Crawford and Old were appointed to be the Otago province's official agents in Scotland. Their office was just here in St Andrews Square, only a block or so away from John McGlashan's old office and just around the corner from St Andrews Church where the disruption had begun. A similar agent was appointed in London, and the key difference from what had gone on before was the scale of operations. The new provincial government was able to draw on a much bigger pool of funding than the old Otago Association ever had access to. It could float loans on the London financial markets to underwrite its big projects, especially assisted immigration. The price of land in Otago was lowered considerably too. Meanwhile, there were ongoing rows about exactly what sort of immigrants should be recruited. Captain Cargo and his supporters maintained that there should be a more or less exclusive focus on Scots of the right sort, by which they meant lowlanders and free church folk. He thought that having an agent in London was just a bad idea. John McGlashan, meanwhile, publicly argued for an ongoing Scottish ascendancy as essential to Otago's good character. To most people in Otago, though, 
these ideas seem simply old-fashioned. What was required was more people, and lots of them. Substantial funds, £20,000 over three years, were set aside to recruit and transport thousands of new arrivals, including from Melbourne and even Auckland, but mostly from Britain. Of course, Captain Cargill was not a man to give up on his principles, and despite being overruled by the provincial councillors in Dunedin, it was Captain Cargill who controlled all the communications with Otago's agents in Edinburgh, Crawford and Old, and he told them exactly the sort of immigrants that he wanted, those from north of the Tweed. And then in 1857, he appointed James Adam to go home to Scotland on a big recruiting drive for Otago. His mission was to attract men and women exactly like himself. Hard-working, lowland Scots with free church convictions. Now, Adam's appointment came over some fierce criticism in Dunedin. To his social superiors, especially the English ones, he seemed a bit rough, a bit working class, a bit too Scottish perhaps. And of course, he was absolutely devoted to the old captain and his causes. But as it turned out, he proved to be excellent as an immigrant recruiter. For one thing, he knew what he was talking about, and so was both convincing and could answer practical questions. And as a successful immigrant himself, a humble settler made good, someone who owned land in Otago, he was the perfect exemplar of what could be achieved by emigrating. Adam gave dozens of lectures all over Scotland, just like the one that he'd attended in Aberdeen back in 1847. Writing home from this very hotel in Jedburgh in the Borders region in November 1857, he gave a progress report on all the meetings he'd held recently in the area at Heaton, Langham, Hoyk, Lilliesleaf, Coldstream, Dunce and Wooler. And he then headed north to Aberdeen, his hometown, and undertook another sweep through Inverurie, Old Meldrum, Huntley, Fokarbers, Elgin and Fuscordon. He later claimed to have travelled over 119,000 kilometres during his 20-month-long mission, crisscrossing Scotland over and over again. As a result of these efforts, eight ships were dispatched to Otago with over 2,000 new Scottish immigrants aboard before he returned to Dunedin himself in 1858. Many more followed into the 1860s as subsidised passages continued on various terms. Adam returned to Britain for another stint as immigrant recruiter in the 1870s, and his autobiographical work, 25 Years of Immigrant Life in the South of New Zealand, 1874, was widely distributed to prospective immigrants. Huge numbers of New Zealanders can thank the persuasiveness of the man from Bon Accord, Aberdeen for their family's migration to Otago. In this second phase of Otago immigration from 1858 to 60, the larger complements of passengers destined for Port Chalmers made single destination shipments to Otago more economic. Four of the Adam recruited shiploads from 1858, for example, left from Greenock, while another one left from Leith, the port of Edinburgh. They included the Robert Henderson, a brand new clipper ship built specifically for the New Zealand trade by the Glasgow-based Patrick Henderson Shipping Company. She reached Port Chalmers on her maiden voyage in February of 1858 after an incredibly quick 79 days. And over the next 12 years or so, this zippy little clipper ship was to make a further nine voyages to Otago. The other three ships, however, still left from Gravesend with London's status as an international shipping hub making it easier to organise such charters from there. But direct departure from Scotland was becoming more normal and over the coming years, the Patrick Henderson Shipping Company was to develop a whole fleet of ships specifically for the New Zealand immigration run. By the 1860s, they had a monthly service operating from their base here at Springfield Quay in Glasgow direct to Dunedin. Now on arrival, the assisted immigrants were entitled to a certain amount of the time in immigration barracks that had been erected for them just here on Princess Street. Now they were a big improvement on the original grass hut barracks that the Pioneer Party had used on the original shoreline back in the day, but they were still pretty basic structures, just unlined weatherboard. The barracks were gradually extended until by 1860 they could accommodate 700 new arrivals. Part of the complex later became the armed constabulary barracks, which is why this is called Police Street. Now, they weren't designed to be particularly comfortable because no one was supposed to stay there for very long. 
prospective employers would come along, they would recruit you to a new job with accommodation and you'd move on, ready to begin your adventure as a colonist. Many of the new arrivals were following relatives or friends who had come earlier and were pursuing similar dreams. James Adam reckoned about 20% of his recruits were in this category. One interesting example is the Brown family, who came on the Strathfield, say, in 1858. John, Daniel and Mary Brown were born at Milngai near Glasgow. The brothers were textile printing technicians, but their specialist skills had become redundant by the 1850s with changes in their industry. An elder brother, James, a textile designer, was already in Otago, having come out in the first year of the settlement on the Larkins with his English wife, Anne. James Brown had done pretty well in Dunedin, first as a painter, and then by establishing his own engraving business. But he also earned a reputation as a wonderful caricaturist, with a series of drawings of Otago's leaders that captured their likeness, but also pointed out their foibles. He is in fact considered New Zealand's first political cartoonist. His positive reports no doubt prompted his younger siblings to move, and they duly took ship with John's wife, Daniel's wife and children, and their sister Mary a decade later. As the 19th century progresses, there's more and more information from government, but there's nothing to beat the letter from, you know, a, a brother, a sister, a cousin, a former neighbour, you know, giving that kind of imprimatur that, yeah, you know, you know New Zealand is altogether a delightful country. John Brown's diary of the Strathfield Say Voyage is kept here in the Toy Two archive, and it's a fabulous account of what was a very turbulent passage. All sorts of dramas are recorded in here, including the captain and the purser shortchanging the immigrants on their ration allowance, and the captain being caught in scandalous circumstances with one of the young female immigrants. John also records the often violent rows that occurred between different groups among the steerage passengers, strangers crammed together amidst a very crowded environment there, so kind of expected, I suppose, but also the domestic tension between his brother Daniel and Daniel's wife Helen as they tried to look after their six children in very trying circumstances. Daniel and Helen's difficulties continued after their arrival. The printing technician from Kilbarkin seems to have begun work here as a carpenter. But in March 1859, less than a year after the arrival, he purchased 20 acres of farmland in Roslyn. He then commissioned the building of a stone house on this land, but no sooner had the walls been erected than a heavy rainstorm saw them collapse completely. Now Daniel sued the contractors and was awarded full compensation, but his family still needed a house to live in. So he bought a Kitsett house from Australia that was being sold off by a church organisation. There have been renovations over the years and some additions, but this is that house, the oldest in Roslyn. It takes us back to a time when this area was a farm being carved out of the bush by a Scottish textile worker reinventing himself as a farmer on the periphery of Dunedin. Daniel and Helen lived here right up until their deaths and their family until the 1930s. By that time, this whole area was built up and suburban. This street was actually named for them, originally as Brown Street, but then with council amalgamations and name duplications, it became Lundy Street, which was Helen's maiden name. It wasn't just immigration that the new provincial government set in train in the mid-1850s. It also picked up on all those infrastructural developments that the collapse of the New Zealand Company and the Otago Association had put an end to at the beginning of the decade. Now Dunedin was in a very woebegone state by this time with work to be done wherever you looked. And developing roads and bridges in the outlying districts was equally urgent. But before any of that could happen, detailed surveys had to be undertaken with charting of the large expanses of land and inland Otago along the coastal zone that were still just blank spaces on the map. Otago was very fortunate to engage the services of a highly talented Scottish surveyor, John Turnbull Thompson, who was born at Bamburgh, just south of the border and educated at Aberdeen University. He had just spent a dozen years working as the government surveyor in Singapore, followed by two years at home after his health broke down. 
Once recovered, he looked for work in a more temperate climate and set sail for Auckland. Appointment as the chief surveyor of Otago quickly followed and he arrived in Dunedin in May of 1856. His first major task was to survey the site for a new town in the south of the province, Invercargill, giving that city its wide main streets and many reserves. Then there was the surveying of the province itself, huge tracts of which remained unmapped. And if they were unmapped, they couldn't be sold or developed. There followed two years of marathon survey expeditions by Thompson and his small staff, vast sweeps on horseback that took him as far north as Auraki Mount Cook and as far west as the Waio River, often in appalling conditions. The survey maps that followed were masterly pieces of work, but perhaps more important were the many names that Thompson bestowed on features of the landscape. Much of the nomenclature of the province owes its origin to this grand surveying effort. And many of them reflect his family's origins in the Scottish borders. Dunstan, Earnslaw, Earnsclew, Hawkden, Lauder, Lindis, Nenthorne, and St. Bathans among them. And then there are his paintings. Thompson was a skilled landscape artist and he captured the first recorded views of many Otago vistas. This painting in the Toitu collection, for instance, shows Dunedin as it was when Thompson first arrived here in 1856. In his own words, It was then but a hamlet, a ludicrous parody on its great mother of Edinburgh, sunk in poverty and filth that had earned the more appropriate title of Mud Eden. <laughs>